Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're trying really hard to uh, protect the skies, keep the skies dark. We've worked really hard to promote good quail habitat here on the ranch. There they are. And we're hoping to get this ranch like it was back 200 years ago. In 1987, we traveled to the western part of the state to experience the beauty and mystery of the rock art of Texas. taking Texans outside for 30 years. There's something magical about this place. It, it's like nothing else. We're trying really hard to uh, protect the skies, keep the skies dark. Without the dark skies here, we, we'd be in a world hurt. It's beginning to encroach on us. The uh, dark skies, the remote location, uh, the high elevation, the dry climate, and the southerly location all combine to, to make this uh, an ideal spot for, for an observatory. McDonald historically, and uh, certainly uh, ongoing today, has had a very active public outreach education program. Astronomy is an excellent vehicle for science education in the country. I don't have the, the technical inclination to be a, you know, an astrophysicist. The, the math and the physics stuff uh, escapes me. The biggest part of my job responsibilities are maintaining the, the dark skies, keeping the skies dark for the observatory. Dark sky just means the lack of any artificial light sources, the anthropogenic light, uh, man-made, you know, human origin light sources. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. I mean, light pollution wasn't a term anybody would have understood 100 years ago. And astronomers are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. We're the first ones to say, hey, wait a second, the skies here aren't as dark as they used to be. Tens of billions of dollars a year worldwide is, is just wasted up into the night sky. Uh, light that's doing nobody any good whatsoever and is blocking our view of the stars. One of my earliest memories is uh, watching the moon rise through a pair of binoculars leaned up against a window. Ever since then, I've been fascinated by the night sky and looking through telescopes. It's gonna look like a garage sale in here. The new uh, upgraded parts are still being attached to the telescope. There we go. Yeah, it doesn't even look like it. I mean, I've had people come in here and go, so where's the telescope, you know? The amount of data collected by the telescope is uh, about to dramatically increase. Gathering light from some galaxies that are 10, 12 billion light years distant, very faint objects. Um, we're talking about maybe a dozen or so photons per hour will be collected by the telescope. So if the, the background sky 
gets brighter than the faint objects we're trying to uh, observe, then uh, we lose them or they're lost for observation. So um, it's critical that we maintain the dark skies here at, at McDonald Observatory in West Texas. It's an amazing project. It's really remarkable. Can't wait to get on a star. When you say pollution, you don't think of light as being in that category of pollution. So uh, it's not something you think you're doing wrong. And when I talk about the dark skies, I try to help people understand how easy it is to preserve them. All it is is a choice you make at Home Depot to buy the light that points down instead of points up. And doing it here, I think is important because people can see the dark sky. And once people kind of get a an idea of to what they could have in their backyard, they're more motivated to go and make those right decisions. You can come into this community at night and you'll think, you know, where'd the power go? Because we as a group, you know, keep our night lights either directed downwards or don't use them, but it's encroaching from, from other areas, particularly the oil patch in Permian Basin. The only way to keep McDonald Observatory working and safe and viable is for dark skies. We've seen the glow along the horizon to our northeast steadily increase. We are not against outdoor lighting at night. This is not an anti-light campaign. We're trying to promote good lighting. First off, there are ordinances in place, outdoor lighting ordinances in place in the uh, seven counties that surround McDonald Observatory um, that basically ask that light be kept on the ground and out of the sky. Within the seven counties, the Texas Railroad Commission has let right at 5,000 permits in five years uh, to drill uh, for oil and gas. And that's just the drilling. Uh, that doesn't take into account all the facilities that go along uh, with, uh, with oil and gas production. So there are literally thousands of installations within the region that's protected by law uh, to keep the skies dark. I don't think a single oil and gas operator even knew that there was a lighting ordinance in place. Our ability to, to enforce a dark skies ordinance type thing sort of ends at the county line. For us, there are just so many things we can't do. We're not talking about enforcement, we're talking about education. You can force people to do a lot of things, but the better thing is to educate people how important this is. I've been to probably a dozen major conventions over the past year and a half. Bill's a great guy. I mean, you know, he can sell this, and he does sell this, and he goes around, and, and you know, that's, that's what we have to do is educate. It's not a technical problem, it's an educational problem. I don't think there's anybody that's uh, insensitive or doesn't care, it's just not a blip on their radar screen. A lot of them will say, well, I never really thought about it before. Uh, but once they do, it's like, well, sure, this is, you know, this is the problem that we don't need to have. If we can just keep the light on their work and out of the sky, problem solved. Going to a state park in a place away from the city, it's a really majestic feeling. We're really using our state parks as demonstration sites. We'll just do a tour of the constellations and people can learn a little bit. And then we'll start talking to people about light pollution and how they themselves can help reduce some of the light pollution. Because when you do go and see the Milky Way, it's a really inspiring sight. Today, Enchanted Rock joins an elite group of park, preserves, and other conservation areas worldwide as an IDA International Dark Sky Park. We look forward to a long and enduring relationship with Enchanted Rocks and Texas Parks and Wildlife that will help us keep the stars at 
at night truly big and bright. Please accept this award with our compliments. Congratulations, Doug. Really, man. Yeah, you did, you've done so much. You've done so much. Mm -hmm. Do people living in urban areas notice that they're missing anything? Some don't. But if they've never really seen it, then it's, uh, it's hard to convey um, the meaning or the value that it might have. There's nothing quite like um, getting out under a starry sky and actually seeing it for yourself. Charlie and Scout are flushing quail on their ranch in the hill country. There they are. An area not known for quail. It's a good girl for flying those quail. We've worked really hard to promote good quail habitat here on the ranch, and we're hoping to get this ranch like it was back 200 years ago. This is the ranch house where Charlie's wife, Marcy, grew up with her mother and two sisters. My mother was a very strong woman. Uh, she was able to come out here by herself with just her daughters and run the ranch and, and make a living at it. They managed the ranch by themselves, raising cattle and sheep. When Marcy married Charlie, they set out to heal the overgrazed ranch. And we really were starting from scratch. Rangeland recovery is a slow process. It takes a lot of dedication and, and passion to stick with it. It's been really impressive to see to the quail uh, rebound. Better pathways for him. And also but also better. how quickly his rangeland has responded to his management practices. I mean, it's amazing how well this site has recovered with this reseeding. Oh, well, looky here. Let's, let's take a look at this. We also are seeing a lot of first choice browse plants. More simply put, the bluebell ice cream plants. Look at there, Texas Sephora. The plants that taste really good to critters like white-tailed deer. Legend has it that outlaws hid out in this canyon. But now Charlie battles invasive cedars to clear these views. The impact that Charlie has had on the landscape is at a scale much, much larger than this 1,500-acre ranch. Charlie has invited landowners out here. He's used this site as a demonstration site. People have witnessed the benefits of some of his innovative management techniques. Oh my God. As the land has slowly recovered, a family has grown with it. Oh, what the fuck? I have so many great memories from coming to the ranch growing up. We've been coming for as long as I can remember. Marcy and I both came from broken homes and we wanted to foster that connection with the ranch and the, and the kids and, and the family bond. We first started going to the ranch uh, a lot when I was nine years old. We put a lot of work and sweat into the land and it made everything better. The deer, the quail, the turkey, it kind of united us in a common interest and that made us uh, very close. There's just something about once you get on the ranch, there's just a certain fundamental connection to nature. Good job, Lane. Excellent, nice fish. It means everything to my dad. He loves it. Like, this is his favorite place in the world. As the next generation grows up on the ranch, Charlie and Scout will continue to keep an eye out for quail. Nature does not stay stagnant. It continues on. Good girl.
Wish you could spend more time with nature? Well, every month you can have the great outdoors delivered to you. Since 1942, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine has been the outdoor magazine of Texas. Every issue is packed with outstanding photography and writing about the wild things and wild places of this great state. And now, Texas's best outdoor magazine is available as an app. It's just that easy. Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, your connection to the great outdoors. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. To celebrate this milestone, we're taking a look back at some of the interesting stories and unique characters that we've discovered over the past three decades. In 1987, we traveled to the western part of the state to experience the beauty and mystery of the rock art of Texas. This desolate expanse of West Texas desert was once home to hundreds, perhaps thousands, of roaming tribes of people. We have evolved into a far more complex society, leaving behind our desert past. But in so doing, we've lost valuable moments from our history, waiting to be uncovered deep in hidden mountain ranges among the canyon walls are the captured moments of a time gone by. At the place where the lower Pecos River meets the Rio Grande can be found one of the richest legacies of rock art in the United States. Within these secluded rock shelters, once home to prehistoric people, are strange and mysterious art forms. They are the only lasting remnants of a people unknown to us today. These pictographs, drawings or paintings on rock surfaces, have become one of the most puzzling mysteries to be solved by modern man. The thing about rock art is that it tells you something about a long gone people that you don't get in any other way. An anthropologist by training, Dr. W. W. Newcomb Jr. was one of the first people to author a book that takes an in-depth look at the rock art of Texas. It still does things for us in terms of, of uh, emotional impact on people. Uh, I know a, an anthropologist uh, who, when he first saw some of the giant, I call them shaman figures in the lower Pecos, cried. What is it about this art form that intrigues every person who encounters it? Perhaps it is the massive size of some of the panels, which can range well over 15 feet in height and span more than 100 yards across. And there are the mystical figures, thought to be shamans, spirit forms of a past culture, which create a strange and mesmerizing effect. They give the feeling that you have entered upon a sacred tomb and glimpsed a forbidden place. You become aware of their simplicity, their subtle yet formidable beauty, which draws you towards a more complex, perhaps sacred message, if only you could summon the vision to decipher its meaning. The most difficult style for me is the Pecos River style. Uh, it's rather enigmatic and people tend to uh, see in a great deal of psychological expressions and it really gives you very little concrete about what the people were doing. It's mythical. And that's the one that I believe we're going to have a lot of trouble with, because I don't know if modern man can understand the myths of the people that were painting that, those pictographs. It's impossible to accurately date this rock art. But from dating archaeological remains found in the area, 
scientists believe these pictographs were probably made five, perhaps 9,000 years ago by a hunting, gathering people. This rock art is considered to be among the finest in the world. Many of the rock art sites are located in far out of the way places. For those with the inclination and determination to venture into this seemingly uninteresting and inhospitable desert, there waits a spectacular treasure. Seminole Canyon State Park, located 45 miles northwest of Del Rio, houses two of the most famous rock art sites, Fate Bell and Panther Cave. Because vandalism is a major problem, Fate Bell is open to the public by tours only. Panther Cave is accessible only by boat and is protected by a 12-foot high chain link fence. For the most part, the pictographs remain intact and remarkably represent some of the finest preserved in the area. Located just 22 miles northeast of El Paso, nestled within the bolson of a desert mountain range, is Waco Tank State Park. It's an oasis hidden behind a forbidding rocky enclosure that was formed 34 million years ago by an upthrust of molten rock. Centuries of weathering form deep depressions in the rocks. These depressions are called Wacos, which is Spanish for hollow. The Wacos collected sparse but valuable rainwater. Soon this place became a sanctuary, a place of refuge for many desert nomads who made their way to the tanks and left behind them traces of their visits. By far the most impressive relics are the crude yet complex images painted or pecked on rocks. And we may say it's crude, but the only reason it's crude is because of the materials that they had. Uh, a lot of the rock art is not crude. Some of it is extremely finely done. Some of it actually looks like it's been stenciled. How did they make this rock art? What did they use for paints and brushes? Just look around you. Take the leaf from the shucka plant and scrape away the waxy coating to expose fibers underneath and you have a paintbrush. Take the pigment from this rock and grind it down into a fine powder. Then mix it with the juice from the root of a plant and you're ready to paint. If we want the paint to stay on so that uh, if it gets wet that it doesn't come off, we need a binder. So what we need is pigment, binder, and vehicle. Now a binder is some sort of glue that will adhere the paint onto the surface that you're going to paint. Basically the oils, the sap, the egg white, these are all binders. They act as glue to adhere the, the paint onto the rock. It's really amazing to think you can paint a rock wall and have it exist for thousands of years, but that is indeed the case. All these are natural pigments that if you left them laying on the ground, they would uh, retain their color for an eternity. And if you put them on the rock, it's gonna stain the rock rust color and it'll last for an eternity. The rock art has been here for hundreds and thousands of years, yet tomorrow it may be gone. The major threat to these pictographs is not natural causes, but man, who in his ignorance has destroyed many rock art sites. Our greatest challenge is educating people about the treasures that lie here. Will this rock art be here for our children to experience, to learn the lesson that it teaches, to learn to look not with the eyes alone, but with the heart?
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.